Welcome to Play It By Ear, the podcast where I interview people from all walks of life. But they have one thing in common. They're not afraid to admit that they're just winging it. Because let's face it, we all are. In this episode, I interview Paris Scobie, who like me, lives with lifelong bipolar. She shares her fascinating story about how she went from struggle all the way back to stability. Enjoy. So hello, Paris. It's great to have you here. You hey, are Mike. an author, a podcaster, a mental health advocate, and a public speaker. So can you first off start telling us a little bit about yourself and when you first discovered that you had bipolar? Yeah, so I first got my diagnosis of bipolar when I was 19. So I was hospitalized at 19 years old, diagnosed with bipolar disorder, court-ordered treatment, SMI. So for those who don't know, SMI stands for serious mental illness. So got that diagnosis. But prior to that, I was actually diagnosed with depression when I was 16. So I've struggled with my mental health as far as I can remember as early as like 12 years old, like 12, 13, 14 years old. Right. And a lot of it, honestly, like I couldn't exactly explain like what was going on. It was very hard for me to find the language, but I just knew something wasn't right. Something didn't feel right. And I got into the work that I do today. So you mentioned, um, being a public speaker, podcaster, author, mental health advocate. I got into this work because of my experiences. So going through a lot of stuff that I talk about actually, um, inside of my book that I know before we hit record, you told me you just started a little bit of it. So you started reading. So it's actually meant uh, right here. So it's called crooked illness lessons from inside and outside hospital walls. And this is my memoir. So I talk about literally the past 10 years, mainly focused on. So I get into everything in this, in my story. So I talk about my hospitalization, my diagnosis of depression, bipolar, going through sexual assault, um, trauma with that and abusive relationships. And just really a lot of the stuff that I felt so stuck in, but how did I get out of it? So that's really what I wanted to take people on this journey of where was I, what were the pain points? And then what was the things that made a difference for me to be able to come out of that place, to feel able to share this publicly, because that's a big thing that you'll probably hear about. If you know other people who live with bipolar disorder is a lot of people have a lot of shame tied to the diagnosis. So there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of fear that comes with it. And there's also a lot of isolation because at least in my case, I didn't know anyone else in my real life who I knew who had this diagnosis. All I knew was when I would go online, I would go on Google, I would type in people diagnosed with bipolar disorder and you would see celebrities, right? You would see Mm. or movies or TV shows. It wasn't actually anyone that I felt like I I know this person in real life, right? I didn't have that. So I actually, funny enough, I did not expect this to happen. But when I, a few years later, after my hospitalization, I ended up graduating from college and I came home and I went back and I worked at the same exact hospital where I was a patient at. So it was like being in both worlds. Like I went from the patient to provider, to advocate. So that's actually one of the names of my keynote presentations that I give. So, and it's actually pretty funny because it, I didn't know this at the time, but the cover of my book, there's actually three doors on it. So this is, it. it's symbolic of the phases that I went through, right? So this really embodies everything that I felt and experienced prior and during my hospitalization as a patient in the hospital. And then this was my experience as a provider in the same hospital. Now just trying to find my footing, right? Trying to discover what is this? How do I live with this? And then this door is my entrance into advocacy. So getting into being a mental health advocate, getting into launching the podcast, publishing my book, becoming a speaker, and really doing this to help other people feel less alone and more connected. So that's a little bit of it in kind of a roundabout way from the book cover. (laughs) No, that's amazing. It's really interesting because we, we seem like, cause for the audience, so 
I was lucky enough to feature on your podcast last week. And we seem like we've been on quite similar journeys. So for me, I wasn't 19, but I was, I think I was about 21, 22 at the time when I was hospitalized. And we, and when, when I started to recover, I, I was like you, the first thing I wanted to do was go back to those hospitals and give back to try and improve the mm -hmm. service. Um, just talk to people there and try and make the environment a better place. In the end, I didn't do that because um, my parents actually sort of talked me out of it a bit and thought that it might bring up things from the past. But now mm -hmm. we're doing a similar sort of thing in terms of advocating for it and talking mm -hmm. publicly. And I think that's great and it helps more people open up as well. So you mentioned, obviously, um, you were first diagnosed with depression. Is that right? When you were 12 or 13 years old? 16. Yeah. So I 16. was diagnosed. Yeah. So diagnosed with depression. Yeah. 16. So do you think that is part of the bipolar or is it a misdiagnosis? And then do you also think that bipolar is genetic or do you think it's something that your, your family or upbringing like parenting or relationship around you is something which comes from that from a young age or, or yeah, it's just, it's just completely genetic. Yeah. So I do think that I do think there's definitely a genetic component. Cause I know at least for me, mm. I do have family member, family members who have had the diagnosis, who've struggled with this. And I've also, for me, I do think the depression, it's pretty funny. Cause in my book, you'll read it. Like the chapter is literally called misdiagnosis, the second chapter. And I still believe that, right. I mean, it was a misdiagnosis, but at the time I did not have any experience, no episodes of mania, no symptoms of that at all. So all that I had was depression. So I was in such a deep depression for a certain amount of time, but then I would, I would still stay in that state. So I was always lower for sure. Like I was always sad and really overcome with so many negative thinking that slipped into suicidal ideation um, suicide attempts, self-harm, all of this stuff. So it was, I can probably tell you, and I know a lot of what sparked that for me, I feel like looking back was going through the sexual assault when I was 15 and not knowing how to move past that, communicate it, seek help, um, even support myself. I really dealt with it in a very negative way. I would go out, I would party, I would drink. I would just, I thought I'm like, if I go out and I just sleep with other people, it'll help me forget what happened. And then I would also invalidate it by being like, it could have been worse. I could have been killed. I could have, you know, there's so many things that I told myself that really were almost forms of emotional abuse to my own self. Cause I'd be like, Oh, this wasn't that bad. It's not that big of a deal. It could have been way worse. You could have been killed. You could have gotten pregnant. You could have, you know, all these things, right. All these scenarios, but yeah. So that led me to, I remember I, my parents were, they didn't know what to do either. So I remember they were like, we're going to put you in therapy. So I remember I was like going to a therapist but I didn't feel comfortable. Like I felt really like weird about it. Cause I was so young. I didn't know. I've never done therapy before. I didn't even know anything about it really. So I how feel old like were you I, at, sorry, how old were you at the time when you were having 16, therapy? Yeah. 16. Yeah. So I, but I also wasn't open really. Like I didn't, I don't even think I told him like, I just would kind of go into the appointments and it was so surface level and I just would do it because I felt like I was made to go there by my parents, mm. which I feel very lucky and very fortunate that I even had access to something like that. Because there are so many people out there who they can't afford therapy. They don't have access to that. So, but I felt, I just felt like I didn't know how to talk about anything. I just felt like I couldn't, I felt like I shouldn't, I felt like all of these things. So that was 16 years old. So 16 years old, 17 years old, 18 years old. And I was, I was put on different antidepressants and I'm like, none of this is working. Like, I just feel like worse. I feel even more sad. I feel, and I don't know. I just felt like, is this just how life is going to be? So it was pretty, pretty 
just disappointing for, for, yeah, all those years of so 16, 17, 18, and then 19 was r- right before I was hospitalized in December of 2014. So it'll be 10 years this year, which is actually so wild. Yeah. So yeah, I think when you're that age, you're 16, you don't understand actually how you should be in a therapy session either. Yeah. I think it's something that as you as you grow up, you realize that oh, to get the most out of this session, I need to really look inward. Whereas actually my partner's studying cancer and therapy, but there's certain things that they can and can't say, but obviously living wherever I can I can find out how to get the, the best out of it. It's sort of a fifty fifty thing. Um just to touch on the mania that you mentioned, obviously I had mania and psychosis too. And a common thing that I see from others, so based in the comments and when I talk about my own experience, is that there's a lot. So I had heavy conspiracy theory thoughts at the time as my mind was racing. And I also mm-hmm. thought I was a religious figure. Did you have any of those thoughts either? Yeah, so mine weren't, I've definitely heard that too. I've heard that a lot with a lot of people mm. I've had on the podcast. They shared that with me, but I didn't have that experience. Mine was extreme paranoia for sure. Like delusions uh, and really just not being grounded in reality and just feeling like I could not control my mind, my thoughts. And it was a lot of anger and uh, rage and irritability. And a lot of it for me was just, I think for, for me was fed by masking it by feeling like I have to hide it by feeling like I can't talk about it. So I feel like when I did that for so long, my body just shut down and I had, I had that breakdown because I feel like I was living, you know, it was when I was 19 is that's when I had my first experience with, with mania, with mania and went to psychosis. So I can tell you, I was working two jobs at the time. I was, I graduated from high school. I was in community college and I was about to, I think I had like a year left and then I was in a transfer to university. So I went to university of Arizona out here, but I was, I was working two jobs in school full time. I would, I was in a relationship. I would go out all the time. I just was, I just couldn't slow down. And I started bringing this up when I was in an appointment with my psychiatrist one time. And I was like, Hey, like, you know, I found out that, you know, and I talk about it in the book. Like I I say in the book, I was like, there's a family member that has been diagnosed with bipolar in my family. Do you think that I could be dealing with this? Because I'm like, I'm starting to see symptoms when I look online, like people are talking about manic episode and racing thoughts, not able to slow down hypersexuality, like all of these, these signs and symptoms. I'm like, I'm experiencing this. And I remember I was saying this and my doctor at the time was like, he was like, no, like you don't have bipolar. And I was like, why? And he's like, like, basically he was like, you look good on paper. Like I'm working two jobs. I'm getting straight A's. I have a relationship, but I was like, but it's not good though. Like I'm crying all the time. I'm getting in fights all the time with my boyfriend. I'm getting in trouble at work. Like I was like about to get, I've been fired from jobs. Like I was about to quit. Like I was, I would like argue with, um, people at work and then I would like feel really bad and like apologize. And then I felt like, I just felt like this just uh, a big thing of it too, is like paranoia where I walk into a room and I'm just like, everyone hates me or they're against me or they're talking about me or they're judging me when really that isn't happening. Right. I mean, you don't know that for sure, but I was just in such a negative headspace that that was my experience with it. So for me being in psychosis, there was a lot that I don't remember, but I know that the way it showed up was just the day that I was hospitalized. I actually called nine one one nine times. So I don't remember that. <laughs> I don't remember. I just know that I was on my phone a lot, but the, the police came to my parents' house and were like, they picked me up and then took me to the, hosp- the hospital. And they were like, do you know that she's called this number nine times? Like, what is going on? They're like, we're going to take her to be evaluated. So, but again, like that goes back to, to my point of 
I just felt like I was telling people like something's wrong with me. I'm like, this isn't normal. So you'd actually looked it up on Google and suggested yeah. it to the doctor. Look, I think I have this. Yeah. And then it was wow. like, no, you don't because you're getting good <laughs> grades. You're working. And it was like people with bipolar, they, they don't work. They can't have jobs. They're lazy They're So I was like, I would, I was told all of that. So I'm like, really? I'm like, I don't think that, but it's just, imagine that like feeling like you, you know, something's going on and you're trying to share it and you're just told, no, like you're fine. You're normal. So it's like, what do you do? You know, like, how do you live like that? So I feel like I just had a literally had a breakdown and I was like, just taken. And that's when I was evaluated and hospitalized and diagnosed. But I was like this, it, I just felt so out of control. Like it was scary. Cause I'm like, why do I feel so out of control in my own body? Like I can control myself, but I feel like I can't. So it was so yeah. scary. I wonder if those same thoughts and paranoia feelings could relate to potentially the conspiracy theories as well. Cause I know yeah, I actually ran into at my parents' house. I ran into the conservatory and I shut all the blinds. And I was thinking that heavy paranoia, I related it to like, there's someone mm -hmm. out to get me as in like a, yeah. an organization or like the corporate elite or something like that. So that mm -hmm. could be, um, that could relate to the two. And it's amazing as well how you say that at first you, when, when you first started getting the symptoms that you wasn't talking about it at all um, to anyone. And now you've sort of gone full circle to do obviously public speaking and you've got a podcast as well. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a bit more about that? Like how you, how you evolved into it and, and how often you do an event or something like that? Yeah. So what I started doing is I, while I was actually working at the place that I was a patient at, I remember the entire time I thought I was like, this is going to be so great. Like I got this job here. I graduated. I can help. I was like, I can finally help people like who were struggling like me, but the entire time I was there, I felt like I tricked the system. I felt like I was an imposter. I felt like I didn't belong there. I felt like so scared of what if people find out that I was a patient here, like they would not want me here. This would be like, it's, I was like, this is just like ridiculous. Like, why would you hire someone who was so sick? Like I was, and it was just, I was saying that to myself, I would tell myself, but you don't know me. they, all the staff could be there I know. Or, or at least 50% could be. I, I actually crossed my mind so, when I was in hospital yeah. too. I was like, how many of these people are actually helping? Does <laughs> with the owner of this hospital or the, the That's... person that funds it puts a lot of money in. Do they have a past, <laughs> past issue with mental health? Or... Yeah. And that's how I felt. So I, I, that's when I actually started the podcast because I was like, I'm never going to be able to overcome any of these fears. But before that, I actually ended up going back to school and I, I got my MBA in healthcare administration. I, I did that because I was like, I just want to know what goes on in hospital systems and, and like, these places like what a, like i just wanted to have a better understanding of like the business standpoint and stuff so i did that and then and then covid happened right so covid happened and i ended up like i was done i finished school and i remember it was february of 2020 like right like right before because like for us where i'm at it was like really like bad in march it came out all that stuff like all the news and everything but I remember I started the podcast in February of 2020 and I was in my parents' backyard walking and you can hear rocks crunching. And I was talking into my phone <laughs> and I was like, oh shit, like if I'm going to publish this podcast, I need to have an episode title, a podcast title, cover art, like all this. And I'm like, I don't have any of this. So I was like, you know what? I don't care, whatever. I'm just going to call the podcast Crooked Illness because that's that's the name of my book that I was working on. And then I was like, I'm just going to call this episode, the relationship between mental and physical health. And then I just hit, hit send and published it. And then that was, this, and I remember sending it to everybody, a bunch of people I knew. And I was like, Hey guys, I started this podcast. And then, um, I was like scared because I'm like, Oh shit. Like I'm saying this that i live with bipolar like what if people like this is like i've never and i before i started the podcast i actually made some videos before so i would like i had a video that i uploaded on instagram and i actually lost my account so i ended up losing my instagram and my facebook 
And I still don't have Facebook because like, I just, I can't even deal with it. Like I like <sighs> clicked on some email and my accounts got deleted. So I'm like, whatever. I lost all my stuff. I had to start over, but I put a video up and it was just my experience with therapy and then my experience with medications. And then that's, then from there, I was like, I'm going to start the podcast. But the, a lot of it, I can tell you, if I did not do that, I would not have gotten into advocacy. I would not have gotten into mm. speaking. I would never have published my book. I really just had to get comfortable and confident in giving myself grace for my experiences just with that and then sharing it. And, and then from there, it kind of evolved. But the first step I can say, honestly, for anyone living with bipolar disorder is to overcome the shame and fear and isolation. How do we do that? Right. And I know, I know what worked for me. And I also know what worked for the 200 plus episodes that I've recorded on my podcast over the four and a half years from people like you all over the world who have a story, who have a diagnosis. And that's what I did is I said, I want people out there in this world. If it's not my face and if it's not my story, it's your face and your story, or if it's not your face and your story, I have so many people that I've interviewed who can help somebody. And that's what it's about is feeling less alone and hearing these experiences. So that way, like we don't keep it all to ourselves and let us let it trap us really. Yeah. It's, for me as well, it's breaking that initial silence. And when you do speak publicly mm -hmm. about publicly about it, and then I feel like it's almost like a weight off your shoulders. It was quite refreshing for me. Like you just own it. And then mm -hmm. I think people really respect it. And, and especially when you're helping others, um, it makes you feel great. <laughs> I, I personally, right. from my experience anyway, um, if others out there were thinking about doing the same thing, so whether that be starting a YouTube channel like I have, or starting a podcast, writing a book about it, or just speaking public, publicly at events or something like that, what advice would you give those people? Yeah. So the advice that I would give them is to go back to their why and their purpose. Like, why do you want to do this? Right. So why do you want to start a YouTube channel or launch a podcast or publish a book or get into speaking? What do you hope will happen because of that? Right. So really get clear on why you're doing it. And for me, my why is I think about my younger self 10 years ago. And I remember how scared, how alone, how isolated I felt. I was in, in and out of just dysfunctional relationships. I was not taking care of myself. I was not giving myself what I needed to really function how I do today. So I think about that girl and that person. And I'm like, how would her life be different if she, if she knew me today? if she had my resource, if she, if she had insight into this today. So I think about that person. Cause I know there are so many people like that out there. I know there's so many people. So I always go back to that. And that's why I started it because I wanted people to feel connected, to have insight into other, not just my story, but other people's stories. So that's the podcast, but then the book. So the book came actually first. So I started writing this first before the podcast, but the book came from me doing so many interviews on the podcast where I actually read memoirs and stories of my guests, right? So I would have their books that they, they shared with me and they were the ones who encouraged me to publish my story because I can tell you it's everything comes down to your why, your purpose, but then also defeating the fears and the limiting beliefs that we tell ourselves, right? So I had, I had so many fears and limiting beliefs around everything around starting a podcast, publishing a book, becoming a speaker, getting into, I had so many fears about it, but I started with one. I started with the podcast. Then I started, then I did the, then, but the book and then speaking, I've been speaking ever since the podcast. Right. But I can say for me, it, I got my advice for that person. Who's like, I want to do something like this. I'm not sure exactly what I would actually have them just get really clear on your story. Like, what is your story? What did you go through? What helped? What didn't? And then figure out who do you want to help? Why do you want to help them? What do you hope they take away? Right? So just get really clear on who you are, what your message is, how you can help somebody, and then just do it. 
just start honestly like you don't need to, you don't need to have all the stuff perfect you don't need to have the perfect name logo all of that that's great if you do but you can always change it that's another thing like i feel like people get so caught up in it has to be perfect so i can tell you i've changed my podcast name 3 times okay i've had it for four and a half years it was crook the podcast was crooked illness then it was master your mental and now it's live well bipolar so i can tell you guys like can you imagine if if i waited like five, four and a half years later to finally do this because now i'm like oh i have the name mm. like who cares just start with your message and your people will come to you and find you but you will also attract those people and you will also attract your audience by being authentically yourself and saying this is my story this is my message and this is how it can help and this is why i want to do this but really just just starting honestly like if it, whether it's a youtube channel podcast book speaking just start with focus on one thing i would say like don't try to do everything cuz it's too much like don't try to at the same time i'm going to do a youtube channel and a podcast and a, like it's pick one right cuz you, you'll mm. get really overwhelmed um so yeah start with your why and your purpose get clear on your story know why you want to do it and then pick one way to start yeah that's great advice especially when you've got so many social media platforms out there that it's a full-time job probably managing two or three right. but when you've got five podcasts and youtube for me i had to delete as you know i i don't actually have the instagram app i don't have facebook i don't have TikTok. I just spend too much time on it so i thought right i'm going to focus on youtube i'm glad you said just jump straight in because <laughs> for me this is technically my first podcast i've hosted so I don't have a logo. I don't have a name. We're just winging it straight in there. Right. No, but that's how, that's the beautiful thing is like, we're, we connected like you, I had you on my podcast and that episode is going to come out next month. So it'll be in August. It'll come out. But that's the thing is like, you know, we're two people who have experience living with bipolar disorder, psychosis, hospitalization, you know, and that's really what it is, is people coming together and like being willing to have these conversations and like the piece, the rest of the pieces can come together later. Right. You can figure it out. I mean, you can figure it out down the road. Like, Hey, like I'm going to have a podcast and name it this, right. All that matters is the, the meaning behind the conversation to help people really. Yeah. Yeah. So once you got that meaning, then it's probably just comes down to being consistent with it, making sure that you're patient yeah. as well. And I think it's the same thing in business is just, don't think results are going to come straight away give it a year give it two years then assess where you are and go from there mm -hmm. um just to go back to the bipolar and so how do you go about managing your symptoms day to day now that you're more stable is are there any specific things that you do to make sure you, you maintain stability or any things that you avoid yeah so i actually have a free gift that I can give to, to you and like the audience too. So it's a free bipolar wellness workbook. And it's actually what I do to get clear on my symptoms, triggers, things that come up for me, things that are challenging, things that are good or exciting. And it actually really helps me get a whole picture into where I'm at. And then also developing a self-care routine, right? And also a support network, you know, I have therapy, I have medication, I have, there's so many pieces of the puzzle, but I've really been using this workbook and it's a free workbook, right? I mean, I made it, I can give it to you. People can get it for just download it and do it themselves. But that's, and really what I still do to this day is I, I move my body. I go on walks, I go to the gym, I go hiking. And I also like, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I read a lot of books. I read about like 30 to 40 books every year. And a lot of those are people I've interviewed, people I know. Um, and then I also give myself just 10 minutes of silence outside, no phone, just time to, to reflect, I think is huge. But another thing that I started doing actually last month is I do not go on social media at all on Saturdays and Sundays. So I just come, nice. like you said, I delete the apps and I, it really helps me be present with my family, my friends, things I'm at. And I feel like it's also helped me get over this fear of, I always need to record this. I need to share this. I need to know, like just be in the moment. Right. I mean, I feel like I've caught myself at different events and stuff like over the last month. And I'm like, 
oh, this is, I should take a picture and like, it's like post this or put out my story or share it. And it's like, yeah. And, but no, like I could actually be in the moment. So I think a lot of it comes down to knowing yourself, right? Knowing what comes up for you that causes you to feel stressed, overwhelmed, sad, emotional, angry, upset. What are those things? Right. And then honestly, really crafting your environment, your relationships, your habits, your thinking, you can change the way that you think based on the things that you consume, the things that you're around, the things that you just put into your body and mind. It takes a lot of time. And that to say this is like, you'll never be able to hundred percent get rid of negative thoughts. You, you just, as far as I know, there's no one who's done, who's hundred percent like able to like really do that. But also it's just giving yourself time, like, right. Cause like life will always throw things at us that we don't expect that we're not ready for. And especially with bipolar disorder, it can be, it can be a trigger. It can be overwhelming. So I would say the things that I do to take care of myself today is what I outline in the bipolar wellness workbook that I put together my routine and really just getting everything out of my head, writing it down, journaling, tracking this also. So I have insight into where I'm at too. That's great advice. I have also just bought a book, a a daily planner, should I say, where I've started to journal before I go to bed every night. And to be fair, I should have started it way before because (laughs) you know, when you're like trying to unwind and you're trying to fall asleep and you just got so many thoughts in your mind and that could keep you up for like an hour Mm -hmm. just by writing those things down to spend 10, 15 minutes on it every day. And yeah, it's just a massive help. But you're right as well in what you say about trying to limit social media, but you've got found like a healthy balance in terms of just like coming off or deleting the apps just for the weekend. Mm-hmm. Because it's important to remember that those apps are made to that to make us keep going on them and spend as many hours on them as possible oh, as yeah. those platforms drive ad revenue. So that's something as well that really helps me. Um so could you tell us a little bit more about Live Well Bipolar? Um, and the podcast and what sort of guests you have on there and and how those guys or how the audience can tune into it. Yeah. So live well bipolar is a podcast for anyone like us, right. Who is living with bipolar disorder, or it's also for people who have a loved one in their life. Maybe you have a husband, wife, partner, friend, sister, coworker, somebody, right. That, you know, has had this diagnosis or is navigating it. And you just want to learn more. How can I support them? How can I better understand them? And it's also for people who work in the field, right? Whether you are a mental health professional, you are a psychiatrist, psychologist, counselor, life coach, whatever you do, right? If you work with clients who have a diagnosis of bipolar, so pretty much anything bipolar related. So live well bipolar. It's all about how to discover what it means to live well bipolar, right? What does it mean for you? And what does it mean for me? And what does it mean for my other guests? So it's really featuring their stories and their journeys, their work, their and digging into the pieces to have each episode teach you, okay, this could potentially be something that could help me, right? Because everyone has something they share, right? Whether it's journaling or therapy or, you know, getting the right medication or supportive partner. There's so many things that there's like bits and pieces of things that people share that could help someone listening. Right. Cause someone listening might be like, Hey, I'm living with bipolar, but I'm in an abusive relationship right now. I don't have a supportive partner and it's making me feel worse and feel more stuck. Right. So it's helping people listening and people can tune into the podcast it's available wherever you get your podcast. So the main main place is Apple and Spotify. You just look up Live Well Bipolar. You can subscribe. You can listen there. And then also the I have a, a Instagram account. It's called Live Well Bipolar for the podcast on there. And then there is also a way to connect connect with me after that is I have a free newsletter as well where I'll put out um just information on here's why I wanted to share this story, right? Here's why I wanted to have this guest on. And then I'll also share like helpful tips and things that I learn as well 
in that newsletter. So all of that is actually linked in my bio. So on my Instagram account, if you go to live well bipolar, there's a link in my bio, you can click that. There's also the free bipolar wellness workbook that is there. I also made a free self-care guide as well that you can have on there. And then the newsletter, the podcast, my book, all of that is all on there. But I started it again because I just wanted to discover what does this mean? Like, how do you live well bipolar? And I think live well bipolar is it's on the good and the bad days. So I feel like that's something I want to remind people is I feel like sometimes people might be like, Oh, like, how do I even get there? Like I'm having a bad day or I did the work and I'm feeling really good, but like, I feel like I can't stay like this. It, it doesn't, you don't always have to feel, you know, a hundred percent or, you know, be super positive or happy all the time. Right. Cause we're not going to be all the time, but the podcast is, yeah, it's just really restoring that hope back into people who feel like they have lost that. Like I have in the past. So that's live well bipolar. <laughs> yes. Now you mentioned crooked illness, your book earlier on. Yes. Yes. I yes, was yes. lucky enough myself to grab a copy earlier today. And I have to say after a few pages in, I'm hooked already. <laughs> so where can the audience grab their copy for themselves? Yes. So it is available on Amazon. So I have a Kindle version, paperback, hardcover, and audiobook. So it's on there. And the book, it's actually my own story. So my memoir, the I talk about the podcast and the book. I talk about my experiences in the hospital, coming out of the hospital, working there. It's really everything. And actually the good thing too about the book is at the end of every chapter, there's journals for you to go and reflect. So, I mean, just an example, it's, there's one right here that I'm looking at for the end of chapter seven. And it says, reflect, think back to a time in your life where you felt you were at rock bottom. What helps lift you up the most when you were at your lowest point. So it, there's moments at the end of every chapter for you to actually take a pen and reflect and see how you connect to it as well. Love that. I love an interactive book. The best book I've ever read is actually uh, I think it's Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty. And that is, oh, it's yes. got exercises throughout. And I really enjoyed that. Rather than just reading it, taking it in, you're actually doing things day to day. So Paris, thank you so much for your time on the first ever podcast without a name. Yes, I know that. I know. I'm, I was so great talking with you. I loved getting into this this topic because honestly it's really why I do what I do and why I'm here today. So I appreciate you and I'm very excited for it to come out and to share it and to continue the conversation. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode just as much as I enjoyed filming it with Paris. If you did and want to see more like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notifications so you know when the future episodes are coming up. Thanks for watching and see you guys soon.